Today, I'm speaking with Michael Webb. Michael most recently served as a senior aide to Rishi Sunak, where his brief covered everything from UK's economic response to COVID, to artificial intelligence, the UK's science budget, higher education, startups and venture capital, setting up ARIA, the UK's new R&D funding agency, talent visas, and many other policy areas. Before serving in government, Michael was a research scientist at Google DeepMind and received his PhD from Stanford University. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's, it's great to be here. The jobs most exposed to robots, software and AI. So I did a lot of work in, in my paper looking at, okay, if you sort of aggregate and just think about, you know, how does exposure vary overall on average as a function of, um, you know, how much education you have uh, or how much your job is paid currently or whatever it is, right? And so um, I, I found a really interesting pattern of results um, comparing AI to these previous technologies. So what I found was that, so think about a graph where on the x-axis you have uh, income or uh, salary for, for a job. Right, so on the left-hand side, like very low-paid, right-hand side, very high-paid, and then on the y-axis, you have uh, how exposed jobs um, at that level are. Right, so for robots, you have a line um, that basically starts high on the left and then goes down a lot. So it's very low-skilled jobs, so it's low-paid jobs that are exposed to robots, and high-skilled jobs are not at all exposed. Got it. The software you have a very different pattern, which is that actually the lowest skilled jobs are not that exposed and the highest skill not that exposed. It's the middle skilled jobs that are most exposed. And what's cool is that this, this sort of reflects a pattern that lots of other very careful research in economics has found about the impact of software in particular uh, in terms of like it's really impacted middle school jobs. Empirically. Empirically, exactly. Like really careful studies, specifically of software, it's middle school ones are most exposed. Um, so it's like cool that I kind of replicated that in, with this very different method. That is really cool. And then, but the really interesting thing is for AI... It's a completely different pattern again. So for AI, um, it's actually the sort of upper middle scale jobs that are most exposed. So the line kind of starts in the bottom left um, at like a low level and then it goes up and up and up and up. And it peaks, I think, at the sort of the 88th percentile of, of jobs as by sort of by salary, right? So like really, really upper, upper income, upper, upper sort of high paid jobs and then sort of goes down at the very top. Okay. In terms of, so, you know, the CEOs pay the most and not exposed so much, but the sort of the upper, the, the lawyers and the accountants, whatever, they, they actually are exposed. Um, Fascinating. And just quickly before we go to the story, the really interesting thing is that the OpenAI paper using a different methodology and focusing very much on GPT-4 and these new large language models as opposed to the sort of a slightly earlier vintage of AI I was focusing on, they like kind of replicate this, this figure and for, with their measure. And it's basically exactly the same. Wow. So the same that's pattern. That's cool. Really validating. Now, actually, turns out that many of those jobs are the most regulated jobs. So the doctors and the lawyers and the accountants, they're the ones who actually have the most power in the economy and society to put up barriers and stop the exposure that might otherwise cause them to, you know, be paid lower wages or whatever. They can like, you know, pull up, pull up the drawbridge and stay, stay happy as, as they are. But on the sort of the pure economics of this, sort of before getting to the sort of political economy, um, this sort of fancy pretend, pretend world where there's, there's no actual humans and there's no politics, um, it's, it's those jobs that are, that are most exposed. How automation can actually create jobs. Let's still just look at this one sector that's getting automated and think about whether it really is the case that when you have big automation in a sector, the number of humans go down. Again, that's intuitive, right? You know, sure. automation means for your humans. Done. Turns out it's not that simple. And so there's a few uh, examples, I guess I'll start with, then we'll sort of, we can talk about sort of what the broad lesson is. So here is one example. I think this is due to uh, Jim Besson, who, who's an economist, who studied ATMs. So ATMs, you know, where you cash machines, right? You go to a bank branch and get, get cash out. So before ATMs, there were individual humans in the bank who would like, you'd go up to them and show some ID and get your you know, account details and they would give you some cash, right? And bank tellers, I think they were called. And you would think, right, ATM comes along, that's it for those people. You know, no more bank tellers, huge declines in employment in the banking sector. Right. And what in fact happened is something quite different. So the ATM did indeed um, reduce the number of people doing that specific task of handing out money, right? But of course, there are other things people do in bank branches as well. The big thing that happened is that because a given bank branch no longer needed to have all these very expensive humans, you know, doing the, the, the cash handing out, it became much cheaper to open bank branches. And so, huh, okay. whereas before there were only bank branches, perhaps in, you know, the sort of larger towns, or whatever, suddenly, banks were competing to open branches everywhere, because 
you know, the more you can, you know, go into the, the smaller and smaller towns and, and whatever, you know, villages, who knows, you can, you know, have more customers and provide a better service and, and so on, right? And so what happened was the ATM meant there were fewer staff per bank branch, but enabled the opening of many more bank branches overall. And that actually offset the first impact, right? So fewer staff per bank branch, but so many more bank branches that the total number of people in bank branches actually went up, right? What they were doing was quite different. The humans now are doing sort of more high value add activities. They're not handing out cash. They are doing other kinds of services. But, you know, similar people doing a similar-ish job. um, And there's actually more of them now, right? And so the sort of the fancy economist way of putting this is it's you have a sort of a demand elasticity in the presence of complementarity. So those are crazy silly words, but this is exactly what I mean. Yep. So demand elasticity means when you reduce the price of something, you actually want more of it. So when automation generally brings a cost of things down. But what normally happens is it's like, great, I have the same amount of stuff. He's like, no, I want more of that stuff now. Give me more, 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 more. Then in the presence of complementarity, that means that, um, so complementary, we think of, you know, if humans are complementary to the automation, the, the technology, whatever it is, in some way, right, there's still some humans involved, like fewer than before per unit of output, um, but still some. Sure. Then, because people now want more and more and more of this stuff, it's sort of each unit of the thing is more automated, but there's still some humans involved, and therefore you end up possibly having ever more humans um, totally demanded, doing slightly different things, but still roughly in the same ballpark. How automation affects employment at the individual level. So the final thing I think is really interesting to think about, and is not often not intuitive, is thinking about the impacts on individuals, right? So we've talked about, we've accepted that there definitely could be some individuals who are, you know, whose jobs existed, and then they don't, they sort of they disappear because they're being automated. That, 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 you know, nothing I've said so far is saying that doesn't happen. That, that certainly happens a ton. Mm-hmm. Right. And I've given you some examples of why we shouldn't worry so much, perhaps, about it because there's like more demand than other bits of the economy, whatever. But like, what does that look like for the actual person experiencing it? Um, and is it, is it good or bad? And, you know, when is it good or bad? And so there's a couple of like really interesting facts about the way things kind of work in, in the economy that I think are, are worth touching on briefly. So the first one is that there is this not very nice term, but it's, it has, has a sort of benign consequence. So the term is natural wastage. Um, so if you are if you're a company and you're you're hiring people so let's, let's say you're, you're mcdonald's right and um you're mcdonald's and and people sort of leave you know the average tenure is they start working for you and six months later they leave and go and get, get a better job right yep. so that sort of half of people leave within six months whatever um that's called natural wastage people are sort of naturally leaving um and you'd include people retiring and whatever as, as well as part of that um also natural natural churn so that means there's a sort of very natural uh, attrition happening in, in all companies all the time and so supposing let's take mcdonald's as an example so if mcdonald's somehow automated everything like the burger flipping and the cashiers and other <laughs> they've been trying for a long time right they're, they're sort of slowly happening but there's still some humans there right now um supposing they sort of they, they did it right all they would have to do is stop hiring any new people right and within a year they would just have no employees because just within a year, everyone naturally leaves and goes and get a better job anyway. That, that generally is what happens. <laughs> right. so the, you know, the average tenure is, is like six months at McDonald's. Okay. Um, so you just sit, sit and wait and everyone, everyone goes of their own accord. No firing required. No displacement required, right? And it, it makes a ton of sense, right? Because if, if you're sort of the, 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 the mastermind organizing the economy and sort of allocating people to different jobs, like... Obviously, that's not what's happening. But like, if you were the mastermind, um, you would choose. It would naturally be the right thing to say, no, people who've got all the human capital and they've worked in the industry and they're going to find it really hard to, to move, let them keep the jobs. Um, and then the young people, they shouldn't get into it because that's a bad bet for the long run. They should do something else, right? And obviously, you know, people sort of make those decisions for themselves and that's what happens. Yeah. So you have these, you know, really, really interesting uh, effects of, of that kind. Now, where does that go wrong? It generally goes wrong in, uh, in a couple of sort of circumstances. Namely, it's very inflected by geography. So what we know in terms of like, where can you go and see people who have like actually really been hurt by a automation technology coming along or, or maybe a other kind of, so trade as a big example, you know, China comes along, suddenly makes things cheaper. Um, if you are a young person in a big city and you were doing some job, um, then and you know, that, that job goes away, whatever. Loads of other jobs. Yep. Fine. You're going loads of other options. Go do something else. 
if you are a a older person um, who's been at a particular firm for a very long time in a town where that firm is the only large employer and there is no other industry in that town. And and also, like, you've got this amazing, like, union job, like, your wages are really high because of, you know, decades of, you know, strong, um, you know, sort of, like, worker uh, empowerment and so on. Um, and then that that company goes away from that town. Yep. That is not a good place to be because empirically people turn out to be stuck in their towns right they sort of they just don't like moving and if, if you're like in your whatever age 40s 50s got a family um kids are in school and your job, goes, job goes away your it's house. like exactly yeah. in school yeah it's like what i you know your house is now worth nothing so you can't you, cause, because there's no jobs anymore so like, you can't sell like you can't sort of sell up and move somewhere else that's that's really hard you can't sort of sell your cheap house and move to a much more expensive house in, in a city somewhere else right um your kids are in school as you're saying etc etc so what you see is people sort of they kind of get stuck and there is no um no job of any like comparable uh quality that they can do and so there's you know on average when you have these these sort of big plant closures um people do tend to go and get other jobs but they often experience big wage declines like 25 percent sort of enduring wage wage decline that's not nice that's really horrible yeah. that's a really horrible wow. thing to happen to someone yeah and that can happen you know that sort of happens to large numbers of people at the same time in these sort of geographically concentrated ways um that's where things get get sort of get bad and so like if you're young in a city you're kind of fine um if you're older or you know sort of mid-career older in a small town with a single <laughs> employer and that's the thing that gets automated that's when things look much less rosy how long it took other game-changing technologies to have economy-wide effects. I think maybe the right way to approach this question is we can start by very quickly talking about, like, what's the baseline? Like, how long do these things take for, like, other technologies that, like, were as big as AI, um, as AI seems to like, like it will be? And then we can talk about, okay, why might AI be different? And, and what will be the same? Yep. Right? Okay, so... So the two big examples that are, um, I guess, everyone's favourite are sort of IT, sort of computers in general, and then electricity. So these are probably the two biggest general purpose technologies of the last, certainly, you know, 150 years. So how long did, did they take? Well, there's an astonishing sort of regularity in how long these things took. So if you, um, if you date the arrival of electrification to 1894, which is the the time people, uh, economists who study this uh, tend to use. I think it's a couple of years after the first sort of proper power station was was uh, was built. Okay. And if you date IT to 1971, I'm not sure why economists use that date. Maybe it was when, I don't know, some sort of IBM mainframe properly came online or something. I'm not sure. sure. Anyway, so those are the dates people seem to use in, in economics, right? And if you plot the sort of if the x-axis is sort of years following the arrival of it or electrification and then the y-axis is percent of adoption that's happened so zero percent like no one has it 100 percent now everyone has it right yeah it turns out those two lines sit exactly on top of each other so it diffused Wild. basically as fast as electricity so it's a point one surprising fact number one is that like these things that were like 100 years apart almost took as long as each other, um, even though you might expect things to sort of be moving faster later in history. And the second interesting fact is that it took a long time. So it took uh, 30 years to get to 50% adoption. Yeah, that is much slower than I would have guessed, I think. Yeah. And these things just move really, really slowly. And this is true both for sort of households adopting technology um, or getting access to these technologies and also for, um, you know, industry. Uh -huh. And so we, we, I can, yeah, we can tell you all kinds of interesting things about sort of how, how long uh, it took. So like one sort of, I guess, final quick interesting fact. So if you think about all technology and capital in, in the economy... So I guess take, take the US, right? So think of like every, you know, bit of factory equipment and uh, every computer and everything you might think of broadly as, you know, technology, capital, equipment type stuff, right? Um, the time, so starting in sort of 1970. So 1970, there was basically, you know, close enough 0% of the capital stock consisted of, of software and computer equipment, computer hardware, you know, hardware and software. Um, in 1990, it had only got to about 2%. 
And then by 2000, it had got to uh, 8%. So and the, the real inflection is sort of about 1995, if you sort of look at, look at the graph. But the point is, there were sort of, you know, there were two and a half decades of like actually very, very slow, where everyone thought like, right, this is it, we're here, IT era, right. go. And, you know, 25 years later, nothing to see. And only, right. you know, after 30 years, do you sort of see a real increase. And even then, right, so even in 2000, uh, only 8% of the capital stock consists of computer software and equipment. Yeah. And was most of the thing happening in that early period, like the technology improving or was it just like the technology being incorporated into the world and like, yeah, the world catching up in various different ways took took that long? Very much both. Very much both. Oh, OK. OK. But think about technology in the 70s, right? So compared to like 1990s, like the the IT was getting ever more user friendly, ever cheaper, you know, you know, Moore's law was happening all through this time, right? So you, you wait a few years, it gets twice as fast and half as expensive. Um, right. So that's happening. And you sort of, people have to wait a long time to get to the point where it's actually worth adopting. And it, it takes a long time for sort of companies to adjust all their operations to make good use of, of, of this stuff, right? And we'll, we'll say more about that in a second when we, we sort of think about LLMs. Another example, actually, which is interesting, is the automation of the sort of the telephone system. Uh-huh. So, so generally, like you've seen these photographs of like the generally women sitting in these in front of these huge panels and like connecting calls, right? Plugging, plugging different calls between different numbers. Yep. So, the sort of the automated version of that was invented in 1892. Okay. However, the number of sort of human manual operators peaked in 1920 so 30 years <laughs> after this um yep. at which point at&t which is like the monopoly provider of this is the largest employer in the u.s right they are the largest single employer in america 30 years after they invented the complete automation of of this thing that they're employing people to do and the last person who is a manual switcher does not sort of you know lose their job as it were that that job doesn't stop existing until i think it's like 1980 so it takes 90 years <laughs> from the invention of full automation to, to um, the sort of full adoption of it in a single company that's a monopoly provider and can, you know, it sort of is in charge of, you know, can, can do what it want, basically, right? And so the question perhaps you might have is like, why yeah, on earth? Yeah, what the heck? Why, why is that happening? Why is it taking 90 years? So it's to do with a few things. So one is the extent to which when you start using humans in the system, you build everything else around the humans. And so the humans are generally doing a sort of a bundle of different tasks. Um, and the switching is the, it's kind of the most important one, but it's kind of, it's one among many. And you end up having to sort of do a ton more sort of corporate process reorganization to be able to do the automation. And that takes a long time to sort of to unwind yourself from the world where everything goes to this human because there's many more things happening than just a switch that's been switched. Um, and then the second thing is that, and this is, yeah, both of these are very generally applicable. The second thing is that it costs money to switch from a manual exchange to an automatic one. And, you know, money isn't free. And if, if you're a company, you are going to make investments that, you know, make economic sense and not do the ones that don't make economic sense. Um, and, you know, so the way it worked in the case of AT&T was in the really big cities, you know, it's, think about this, like, there's a fixed cost of automating any particular telephone exchange. The exchanges, you know, are physically located in different places. The telephone exchange in a city is going to have, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of wires coming into it, right? And so it's like, by switching that to automated, you save loads of humans. Whereas all these different exchanges in the middle of nowhere, like in much of all rural areas, right, they um, might only have one human, you don't save much by switching, but the cost of doing all that change and equipment is actually still really high, there's a huge fixed cost. And so you don't bother doing it yeah. until you really, really, really have to. And so if you look at the history of AT&T, they started by automating these big cities. And the very last thing to be switched over to sort of um, from human to automated was this like, I think it was on some island somewhere, like a tiny, you know, tiny population. That was <laughs> okay. just like the last thing that was worth doing. Ways LLMs might be similar to previous technologies. What will make AI similar to other technologies that have been kind of, uh, I guess, general purpose, um, big game changers? Yeah. So I think there's two buckets. There's a sort of humans are humans bucket, and then there's like the government bucket. Um, okay. So let's start with the government bucket. The government bucket is, is basically regulation. 
so I, I put in as a broader bucket sort of just call it collective action um so government is one kind of you know societal wise collective action but there are other things like um unions and professional bodies and all this kind of stuff right sure so uh here's a question do you think that in 10 years time so it's a long time 10 years time you'll be able to just talk to a language model and it will prescribe you a you know prescription only medication which you can then go and collect from a from a pharmacy like do you think that'll be legal because by the way it's possible today right sort of it's good enough basically we're there right you can do that already today it's going to be good enough what would yeah. be legal yeah i guess as soon as i start thinking about it i'm like uh, there are a whole bunch of interest groups uh, that are going to want that not to happen. There are some interest groups that are going to uh, feel worried that it's going to make mistakes. Um, there are interest groups that are going to, yeah, I guess just want to want to be protecting the people in the jobs that are doing that now. Uh, and so it seems at least plausible to me that people somewhere will decide uh, that we shouldn't make it legal. Though, I don't know, in 10 years, it also wouldn't surprise me, to be honest. Mm. Right. So um, you're absolutely right in the sense that so there are these very powerful interest groups. And so, you know, some of the areas that we most affected by AI that we all agree, I think, seem very likely to be better are things like the, what the doctors do and what the lawyers do. Uh -huh. Doctors and lawyers uh, separately have like the most powerful lobby groups you can possibly imagine, <laughs> right? So yeah, like the right. American Medical Association, the British Medical Association, um, and then for lawyers, you know, like it's the, the bar, the bar council, the you know, various solicitors thing, right? So, um, so here's one thing that happens. They do all of the kind of professional standards for that profession. <laughs> of course. And they right. decide who gets to be a doctor. Um, and they decide how many doctors get to be accredited uh, as doctors every year um, or lawyers, whatever, right? And... So if you just you know, open a newspaper, basically any, any day of the week, and you will see how powerful doctors are. You know, regulation has always been something that is kind of regulation by the government slash um, collective interest groups. Um, so unions, whether they're sort of, you know, blue collar unions or whether they're, you know, professional white collar workers, uh, which sound like they're not unions, but they really are unions. Um, um, <laughs> right? They don't uh -huh. have the word union in the title, but they definitely are unions. Uh, they're very, very, very powerful. And so these really, really slow down all kinds of applications, possibly for good reasons, a lot of the time, right? Um, yeah, you know, sort of open, open question in, for any given question, you know, whether, whether we should or shouldn't slow, slow down the application, um, given the harms involved. But like, they are always going to argue for, no, you need the human completely in the loop and we shouldn't change anything and we should keep our salaries the same and so on and so forth, right? I have no idea what's going to happen in any particular case, right? But I think we can be extremely sure that there's a ton of interest groups that are going to be pretty successful for a pretty long time in stopping things changing faster than it's in their interest for them to change. Yeah. Then other bucket of kind of humans are humans in terms of the way they make decisions. So I talked about how LLMs can sort of make it easier to retrain, but you still have to like want to retrain, right? Or do things differently in some way. And so think about teaching as an example, right? Sort of LLMs could completely change the way classrooms are run. And the teacher will spend much of time market, marking and maybe lecturing and more time giving one-to-one -one support, whatever it is, right? Now, you know, maybe teachers want to do that. Maybe they don't. I don't know. I imagine most of them would want to do that, actually. But one thing I'm quite sure in saying is that there is no way the government will be able to force teachers to start adopting this software and using it in certain ways. The teacher is like master of their classroom, right? Um, and there's been many examples of, you know, governments wanting to make teachers do things differently. And generally, it's very, very hard. I mean, there's occasionally, I don't know, like phonics in the UK, sort of things sort of can, can change in certain places. But like, in general... Uh, teachers unions have a lot of power and the government cannot control what happens in classrooms and so that again applies in lots of different places um so the stronger the union that the more it sort of more it applies um, but in general humans don't like change um for the most part they like things where they are right whether ai will be rolled out faster than government can regulate it ai seems like it moves incredibly quickly it, like, if we're going to get improvements to GBT4 that basically, like, double from uh, the ones that we got last year uh, in the next year, will there already just be really extreme impacts? Um, not just impacts, but um, I guess, like, adoption uh, that means that some of these regulatory effects uh, just, like, don't keep up. Uh, mm. And so don't slow things down. Um I guess the way you might expect they would, or they have in other cases. Yeah. 
I think that, so the things we were talking about before in terms of all the reasons that, you know, interest groups and lobby groups can slow things down. Like, as I said, I think those very much apply here. And so even though the technology is moving really quickly. Okay. And they will keep up. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they will keep up in terms of by stopping it being used, right? You don't, whoever thought it's moving, you can, you can always pass it all to say no, right? So um, the thing that I'd be more worried about is the sort of the far the sort of the sharp end of capabilities and the things that you know you've had many guests on this podcast talk about and as well as you know misuse and and those kinds of things that's where i'd be more concerned about regulation keeping pace because there it's not like you have to persuade lots of people to in the world economy to adopt your thing and change their systems all you need is like one bad person to have a very clever thing and to do bad stuff with it right um it's those kinds of things that you have to worry more about regulation moving, moving fast enough but even there i think you know, I'm not an expert on on the history of like nuclear regulation, but there's a lot of, I believe something like the following is true. Like at some point, someone convinced the US government, the US president that like nuclear was like a really big deal. um, And it was possibly, you know, very, very dangerous. And with a single stroke of the pen, I don't know whether it was a presidential executive order or congressional legislation, but like almost overnight, all research on nuclear anything was classified. Right, so you're a researcher, you're just like doing your PhD, whatever, or sitting at home doing some physics of whatever. Suddenly, like, so, okay, from tomorrow, you doing any more work on that is illegal. The government can just do that, right? The US government can do that. And you can imagine that like, if people do enough to convince governments that this stuff is really, really scary in terms of the sort of the existential risk level of this, the government can be like, yep, yeah, okay, you convince me. As of now, we are classifying all research on AI right? Um, that could just happen tomorrow. And then all these companies would just like to shut down overnight. And like, that would be the law and they couldn't do anything about it. End of, end of story, right? That's completely a possible in terms of the powers government have scenario. Okay. So it's not that fast government action is impossible. It's that like, it doesn't happen that often. Sometimes it does happen. Uh, I don't know, like s- suboptimally, it's like too slow. Um, <laughs> Always but- it happens suboptimally, right? Like it's either too slow <laughs> right. or it's too fast and it's too blunt. Too so you might think the nuclear, mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert. I imagine there's kind of stuff that was classified under the nuclear stuff that was like completely reasonable to not be classified and people should still argue, but like they couldn't, right? Um, and maybe we'd, be, we'd have much better nuclear energy today if that hadn't happened, right? So there's all kinds of, you know, ways in which any regulation is going to be very much not first best, second best, or, you know, at best, third best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and right, I think, right, you know, right. we're in a really scary place right now because, um, you know, regulation, uh, if it happens, could, you know, could do a lot of good. It, it could do a lot of harm as well. And so we're going to have to tread, you know, very, very, very carefully. Whether AI will cause mass unemployment in the long term. It feels both low and high to me. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but it could be really high. It could be um, 50%. It could be 90%. It, at some point, uh, we'll probably get to superhuman AI uh, and it can do all the tasks we can and more. Um, but even 50% feels like pretty different to what's happening now. And mm. uh, I'm wondering if at that point, uh, like any of these models will even apply. Uh, at that point, is, just, is the world just too different for this kind of conversation to, to be applicable? Yeah. So I think I'm going to stand up for economists here and say yes. Um, okay. As in the models do apply, all these sort of considerations do apply. So let's think about the question, gosh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be different if we're talking about 90% of, of jobs being automated? Let's go back to a place we started earlier in the conversation, thinking about agriculture in the US. In 1790, in 1790, it was a true statement to say, in the coming years, 90% of jobs will be fully automated. Right. Right. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a true fact. Right. right. That's in fact what happened. Um, now. That's insane. Yeah. That happened over a, you know, 100, 150, 200 year time frame. And so the, 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 the speed of this change is kind of really, really important. Um, but then don't forget back to our talk about, you know, discussion of, of unions and, you know, the American Medical Association and politics and so on. Not to mention all the sort of the sort of rational decisions of company CEOs and so on. There's all kinds of forces that, that mean these things take a long time, even if in theory one could do lots of stuff quickly. There's also this like just capital availability constraints and all kinds of things uh, as, as well. There's just like not enough spare cash flowing around in the world for like, everyone to do that at the same time um or they're like there's not enough resources uh, because like adopting technology you know requires all kinds of work to be done and you can't just like stop the entire economy whilst you retool everything like sort of people still want to 
eat food and they still want to, you know, <laughs> fly in planes and whatever it is. You've got like down tools and say, no, all we're doing for the next five years is switching everything over to LMs. You can only sort of take so many planks out of your boat um, and replace them while you're sailing in the water um, at the same time. And so there's, there's, you know, there's all these kinds of constraints that I think um, are sort of not obvious until you sort of think about them. Um, and so that's, that's, that's point one. So even in a world with 90% of tasks automated, like we have been there before. Um, it happened. It happened lots of times. Um, and we're still here and things are fine, right? Um, and things kind of look not that, they look quite different from 1790, but, you know, many things are still the same. In that sense, things, yeah, things can get weird, but there's, there's still, there's some sort of upper limit as to sort of how fast I think they will naturally get weird from an economic perspective. That said, let's think about, you know, what happens when it is 90%, whether that comes in 100 years time, whether it comes in 10 years time. So I think there's a few really important things here. So we generally are going around saying, gosh, what if it automated, you know, 90% of cognitive tasks? Big emphasis there on the word cognitive. Many, many tasks in the economy are not cognitive tasks. And back to the old sort of thing we've been discussing all the way through as to like when you automate some kind of thing, suddenly like all the incentives go towards how do you make more value out of the stuff that is left that is not automated um, or that, you know, humans, humans can now do because they've been freed up and they can do something else now. Um, and I think there are many, many, many things that are not cognitive um, that, you know, there'll be, there'll be huge amounts of demand for, for humans to, to do. 